Good morning, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yes, I hear a yes over there. Yes. Good morning and welcome. Welcome back to Penn. It's so great to be here for me. My name is Susie Rose and I'm the Senior Vice Dean for Medical Education. I have been here now for just about three months. For those of you who went to school here and know Gail Morrison, I took Gail's position as the Senior Vice Dean for Medical Education, overseeing education across all four years of medical school and across the continuum of learning uh, for our residents and our faculty as well. I am thrilled to be here. I am from Philadelphia originally. I went to Penn as an undergrad and to the Graduate School of Education. I then took a little bit of a journey, a long story, but went to medical school at Case Western and uh, was in Cleveland for a number of years, Pittsburgh, New York City, and most recently came from the University of Connecticut. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, this is an amazing school, an amazing program in medicine, and uh, I came and very privileged to be here, uh, resting on the on the legacy of Gail Morrison, who was here for over two decades, uh, creating innovative programs. So what I wanted to do this morning is kind of lay the stage for you and tell you about medical education and where we are and what's kind of the national trend in education <laughs> and where we're going. And then uh, we have you set up for an exciting morning of interactive educational learning with some of our newer educational techniques here. And um, I think you're really gonna enjoy the next hour and a half or so. So one of the things in our strategic plan for uh, the medical school is it's really great that promoting lifelong learning is one of the pillars. It's one of the pillars of where we're moving forward. And why is that? As you now know, many of you are in practice after graduating here a few years ago, uh, you know that things change over time. So what we need to do is teach our students how to learn information and to know what they don't know, to be able to go out and research it and find it, and then to be able to apply it. So we have committed to champion the concept of lifelong learning in our, all of our educational programs. Let me give you an example. I'm a gastroenterologist, right? So I trained in the late 80s, early 90s in GI. And when I was in GI, there was no hepatitis C. It was called non-A, non-B hepatitis, just as I was becoming a fellow. Now, not only do we know about hepatitis C, we can treat hepatitis C and we can cure it, which is really amazing. So we need to be able to make sure that our learners of today are flexible enough to be able to discard old dogmas and accept new paradigms in education and new, new scientific principles. Uh, we want to catalyze interdisciplinary learning across the continuum. When many of you were here, it was a largely discipline-based, and it was departmentally based. Now we are a team. So you can't do neuroscience without a little bit of neurology and psychiatry and thinking about behavioral health. So getting everybody together and figuring out what makes sense to work together as a team, as teachers as well as students, is going to be really important. We want to leverage the schools here in the university. We are in a very uh, rich environment where we have dental schools and vet school and SP2, and we have law school and we have business school. So we want to be able to leverage those opportunities uh, to bring them into our school so that our students can learn in interprofessional teams and uh, take advantage of this great rich environment. And we want to make sure that we're leading in new educational methods and technologies. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So the first thing I want you to know is we are leading in medical education. That's why I'm here. I knew about Penn from being uh, the, the chair of the Group on Education for the Association of American Medical Colleges, about all the innovation going here. And our best resources really are our faculty, our students, and our staff. Our faculty are engaged, they're of the highest caliber. And I wanted to bring you data, because I wanted to figure out what data could I bring you to say that what I'm saying is really true. So we did a little retrospective looking since last July, July of 2017. We rate our faculty on a, on a scale of zero to four. First of all, we had over 10,000 evaluations. So the touch points for all of our learners meeting our faculty are numerous. But our faculty do really great. Our, our mean was 3.6. So our faculty are teaching, they're very high quality. Our students here are exceptional. I recently had the privilege of reading applications for uh, scholarship applicants, and our students are, are coming here from backgrounds where they've created clinics in Africa. They've discovered new things in science. They have been captains of their varsity sports teams, and they are, have, been, have talent in, in the arts across music, dance, and, and really everything. 
Uh, our students are committed to, the, to service. They're committed to West Philadelphia. And, and many of them are committed to entrepreneurial endeavors and moving that forward. 58% of our graduates tomorrow, graduation is tomorrow, uh, will be receiving an additional degree or certification. That's amazing. Uh, many of our students will get an MPH, an MBA, or will have a certificate, perhaps in medical education. We had an exceptional match. 97% of our matchees match to academic programs, and we have the highest national board scores in the country. It's pretty amazing. So I just wanted you to think about this. There are many factors affecting undergraduate medical education. That's the four years of medical school. There's the explosion of scientific information that we've talked about. There's advancing technologies in medicine, as well as in education. Our healthcare system has changed. So for many of you who are closer to my age, we learned in an environment where we went into a clerkship where patients came in without a diagnosis and stayed for two weeks. That doesn't happen anymore. So how do we teach students clinical medicine in a new, a new environment? There are co complex skill sets for physicians and for specialists. Uh, and there's complex medical decision making uh, because as patients are getting older, there are a lot of comorbid conditions and we have to be able to teach our students about critical thinking and clinical reasoning. The rising student debt is really something that we are concerned about. Uh, our students actually have a lower debt. Uh, than uh, students nationally. Our debt is about $118,000 after medical school, and nationally it's between one hundred and seventy dollars to $190,000. So we're appreciative to many of you for your contributions to our scholarship efforts, and I see the Gambles are here, and their strong commitment uh, to providing scholarships for our students so that we can get the very best to come to Penn and to stay at Penn. We have changing demographics. Our patients and our physicians are, uh, need to look like the communities that they're going to serve. We're very proud here to have a very diverse uh, student body. We are committed to diversity in a large, broad sense related to uh, backgrounds of students um, and where they're coming from uh, related to socioeconomic conditions, uh, race, uh, different degrees, geographic location. It's really important because we get our students into this team setting and they discuss issues and bringing that personal background to that setting is critical and crucial. And we now have a better understanding of adult learning theory that I'll tell you a little bit about. We also have to respect our millennial learners. They have different values from us and we can learn from that. One of the things that they're very dedicated to is balance in their life and that's a very good thing. We need to listen to them and hear them and figure out how to make that work. So as I um, just related that last issue to you, one of the, the things that we're focusing on here is student wellness. And not just for students, but we're thinking about it for residents and for faculty as well. So there has been a focus on student life. We've really matched our student affairs office with our program for diversity and inclusion. Our office of uh, diversity and inclusion actually includes a focus on communities and not only on communities, but on professionalism and humanism in medicine. That office is creating amazing programs, uh, like a culinary um, a curriculum that will teach students about nutrition, but then take it into the community as well. Um, there are amazing things that are being done uh, to make sure that we support our students. We also have our students in four colleges so that they are supported by advisory deans from the minute they get here. And those advisory deans serves, serve as academic coaches and as advisors for future careers. Our um, administration, our leadership is accessible. All of the students have our cell phone numbers. We like to uh, consider that we are all colleagues together. There's no us versus them in our offices. And uh, we're trying to figure out ways that we can better integrate across the two floors on the fifth and sixth floor to make sure that we have more opportunities to see and greet each other. And one of the other things that we've done recently is we brought on-site counseling services from the university uh, to a nearby location, to Smilo, which is actually right here. Um, we didn't want to have it right here on site because students want to have some privacy in seeking counseling services, but we wanted to have it convenient for our students. So it's in the next building um, that's connected here. And so students can uh, come and go and have free counseling services for help, whether it's to discuss an issue going on in their life, financial pressures, more serious issues, or just test tanking anxiety. Um, there are ways that we can support our students. 
So one of the things, everybody's asking me, you're here for a couple of weeks, what's your vision? And it's a shared vision. It's going to be a vision of the faculty, the students, and the staff together. And I have some plans to get us together for various retreats to think about the future of medical education here and where we want to go. But one of the things we're going to have to do is transition to a competency-based curriculum. Uh, for many of you that have gone through medical school, you'll remember you came in on the same day and you marched in sort of a lockstep uh, process and went to the same classes all the, all the time together. Um, and then you took an exam where you probably get 30 or 40 percent of the exam right and still pass the course. We have to figure out, right, what, what the um, competencies are, the minimum competencies that everybody needs to know, and then set the bar really high and say, you need to know, you know, 95, 99 percent of that. But then it's okay to say you don't know and go out and find the information and apply it later. So um, we're thinking about how we can abandon that calendar-based uh, curriculum to go to a more competency-based curriculum with individualized and personalized education. We need to be on the forefront of technology and education. You're going to see a little bit of that this morning uh, using simulation, but there's many other options for that. I personally believe that the future of medical education is going to be holograms and avatars, where our students are going to come into virtual environments and interact in those environments, both to learn as well as uh, to be evaluated. And then we have to think about integrating education across the continuum. Where is a medical student in? What about that transition to residency? And what about CME? And I want to just speak about CME, continuing medical education, for a minute, because many of you in the, in the room are in that stage. 80% of our uh, professional lives are in that CME phase. And we're thinking about what we can do to support you, the alumni, uh, through that. So one of the things that uh, that I did when I came here, it's what, probably my first accomplishment, is when I had to get my Pennsylvania license, I had to take two courses. And one of the courses, I had to pay an external provider because we did not have a course here for opiate training that matched the Pennsylvania license requirement. That requirement is now available online on our CME programming. And we are going to look at all the states around the country, what those requirements are, and make sure that our Penn alumni can be supported for the education that they must have. And then we'll look at education that they want to have. So we have some initiatives and some work to do. So as we transition to our program today, I want you to think about changing pedagogies. When many of us were in medical school, it was the talking head going to lecture, sitting in a lecture room, and having one person talk at you. We now know that that doesn't work so well. A lot of what worked for all of us was going home and rewriting our notes or reading and, and studying that material. Adult learning theory, which we know a lot more about over the past 20 years, is really a bi-directional type of learning. Our, um, our adult learners like to have evaluation, they like feedback, they like it to be relevant, and what a great opportunity we have, even as we study basic sciences, to get that clinical link for our students here. So there's a lot of active learning techniques that we can think about, and you're going to hear about two of them today, uh, well, actually three of them today, uh, simulation, standardized patients, and sort of self-directed learning through activities uh, that can be web-based or, or um, can be through a PowerPoint. Flipping the classroom, many of you probably have heard, heard that term. That means taking that lecture and putting it online. But not just having somebody speak at you and take that full 60 minutes and put it online. What the students want are tapas size lectures. No more than 12 minutes, like a little bite size, right? And so making it the best that you can make it. Making sure that you put interactive PowerPoint or chalk talk materials on on that, uh, within those 12 minutes. Asking questions so the students can think about what you're presenting are really important. Online learning and MOOCs are, are kind of hot right now. Team-based learning, which is not just learning in teams. There's actually a protocol for team-based learning where students actually do work at home. They come in. Uh, they take an individualized readiness assessment test. Then they take a team test. And then they do application exercises as a team. Having used that technique elsewhere, students come so prepared to class. They know so much more uh, than their teachers by the time that they get here. And it's re it really creates a vibrant environment. And then technology-assisted learning, something I'm very interested in. Um, it can be seen, let's say, in the clinical realm as I'm going around and meeting the chairs. I'm finding out that OBGYN has this application for their patients that have preeclampsia so that they do check-ins with their nurse uh, from their phone or their iPad. 
I am learning that in ENT, they have a special device that goes on a phone that they can examine the ear. Our students need to get involved in that. In 20 years, that is the medicine that they're going to be practicing. So I'm going to be working with um, some students to create an elective experience, and I hope that we can create a, a clinical rotation that really focuses on, um, on technology. And then interprofessional activities, getting our students to work together uh, with other professionals. So uh, I'm going to stop there for a second and see if you guys have any, I can take like maybe one or two questions, and then I'm going to introduce the, the, uh, the program to you. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Have you developed your own learning management system or e-learning system? Have you used a commercial system? And is that going to be the platform that you use to extend Penn from Philadelphia throughout the world? So it's a great, a great question that, that you uh, asked. We are on the university's Canvas system. Like two of the main systems are Canvas and Blackboard. It is a system uh, that can be a repository where you can put a whole course online within that system. You can actually deliver quizzes and other things. We do have other systems that interact with it, one called Oasis, where it started out actually at Penn um, as a scheduling system. A lot of other medical schools are using it, but it also offers opportunities to evaluate courses and so forth. We are constantly looking at systems that, that integrate. We, do, we just recently are starting a new uh, learning management system in CME, which uh, will be up and running. And that should be available to our external learners as well. So it's a it's a great it's a great question. Something we've been thinking about. So yes, sure. What are the metrics you want to use to evaluate this? Let's say five years down the road, where they've been successful or not, or putting the individual or the private practice per se in a historic manner. But what are the metrics you want to use to to evaluate this? This is all new and exciting, but you got to figure out. Uh, so that, that is a fabulous question. And actually, whenever you do curricular change, that is the number one question. Um, because how do you know, if it's not tried and true someplace else, how do you set up a system where you evaluate it from the get-go to know that it works? And sometimes, some of the pilots, so what I love doing is using pilots. Because when you use pilots, you can tell early on whether they're going to succeed or not and being transparent with the learners about that and, and, and changing direction when it doesn't work. But some of the metrics we use are some of the outcome measures that we're already looking at. So it depends what you, know, what you want to look at. We can look at things like board scores. And you know, there's a discussion of whether the, the USMLE will go past fail or not. So whether we'll have those in the future, uh, we don't know. Uh, we can look at things like match, match outcomes. We also do surveys of our students when they graduate, uh, both to the program directors and to the when they're interns and residents. And we ask them how well prepared they felt compared uh, to their peers. And um, uh, we ask them about the skill sets that they have. So there are some simple things that we can do, but I think we need to, especially as, as we get to competency-based curriculum, we have to define the entrustable professional activities, those activities that define the tasks of the learner at that point or, or whatever they become, physician or clinician or scientist. And we have to define those metrics and we also have to follow them. So that's something in the competency-based curriculum, the assessment piece is key. So it's an excellent question. The answer to it, we don't have, but it has to be, it, what I can tell you is it has to be set up from the beginning. You can't just start something without thinking about what those metrics are. We just haven't gotten to that stage here. Thank you. One more question. Are you going to be getting into the actual design of the curriculum? We're not going to talk about that today. What we're going to talk about are really three programs that we have, but I'm happy to talk to you about that off, offline. <laughs> I know you want to talk about that. <laughs> so I'm just going to uh, turn the program over now to my colleagues. And um, so you're going to see three very interesting programs that we have here that really demonstrate active learning and in some cases, uh, really in all cases, uh, use some sort of technology. So Greg Lichet is our specialty programs director and oversees simulation here. Simulation is key. Uh, simulation, I'm sure you'll probably maybe define that for us. But I will tell you that it's a requirement, not only in medical school, but almost every residency program have requirements for simulation. Uh, Denise Lamar is our director of our standardized patient program. This is an amazing uh, program. It's a matrix program, I would say, of um, actor patients that 
actually come and they teach clinical skills to our students, as well as using it as an evaluation tool. And Denise will tell you more about that. And then we have several students who are going to be involved today. Uh, Eden Engel Revitzer, Ben Johnson, Mark Bornstein, Rob Mitrani, and Nicholas Moore, who are going to tell you about an adventure that we have in one of our classes. So let me turn it over now to Greg, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the morning. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, Greg Lipschick. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician and also one of the co-directors of our simulation center. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about simulation in medical education. And someone once told me that a picture is worth a thousand words. So watch this. Pipe 130. BP's up, 220 over 140. Come on, he's going to blow an O-ring. Let's try nipride. Oh, uh, what? How did the paramedics miss this? Cocaine. Could be. OK, hold the nipride. He needs a beta blocker, 5 of metoprolol, IV push. Heart rate's up to 140. The metoprolol's in. He's seizing. OK, two of Ativan. OK, Abby, what are the physiological effects of cocaine? It's a sympathetic stimulant. Alpha or beta? Both. VTAC, turning compressions. Uh, charge to 200. Check for pulse with compressions. Clear. Three fib. Charge to 300. Ampibepi. Beta blocker made him worse. Clear. No change. 360. Maybe he's allergic. I doubt it. By blocking beta, you've left alpha on a post. His BP's going through the roof and he's bleeding in his brain. Clear. Asystole. Ampibepi. Okay, what should she give? Pentolamine and esmolol. Gold dot for your forehead. I've seen beta blockers work before. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. You have nursing experience, which means that you can handle 90% of the patient. Unfortunately, it also means you might kill the other 10%. He's not dead yet. Another M. Oh, forget it. That's it. Stop compressions. Just another dead junkie. Congratulations, Abby. You managed to kill the practice dummy. Okay, we sit for the next student. <laughs> so I have to ask before I go any further, does anybody recognize that TV show? Please say yes. yes. Okay, great. Because <laughs> the students don't. <laughs> All right. So, so you've probably heard this term, see one, do one, teach one. This was the way we all learned to do procedures uh, in the past. I'm often reminded at this point, and I tell the story of how I saw my first spinal tap on a Tuesday morning. I did my first spinal tap, lumbar puncture, on a Wednesday morning. And that afternoon, I taught someone else how to do lumbar puncture. And that's probably not the best way. So I'm subtitling this, see one, do one, teach one, no more. And let's talk about the old attitudes about errors and learning to do things. First of all, do no harm from the Hippocratic corpus. This was the way there were many errors that it involved in learning procedures and learning how to do things both in nursing and medical schools. I found this archival footage of our attitudes about these things not very long ago, maybe even 10 years ago. About 1999, this uh, report was produced. It was subtitled to Error is Human, and it talked about errors in American hospitals and came up with these conclusions that healthcare was a decade or more behind other high-risk industries, and they specifically mentioned aerospace, in attention to basic safety. That many patients were dying each year in American hospitals as a result of medical errors about the, about the rate of one jumbo jetliner crashing every day, and we weren't even hearing about it. And they recommended systematic changes in healthcare practices and education, emphasizing two things, teamwork and simulation. Now watch this, because I worked hard on this. And after all, this is tech-based. Watch. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to do it again, because I really like it. 
All right, anyway. So, sim thank you, thank you. So, simulation. What is medical simulation or clinical simulation? It is an environment or technology in which the cognitive and physical skills of medical practice are acquired through the use of. And this list grows every day. So I've mentioned actors, devices, mannequins, but there are other things. There's computer simulations. There are interactive types of simulations. I was just at a National Board of Medical Examiners uh, a symposium on various new types of simulations. So this is growing, and we'll just talk a bit about what's available. So what's so good about simulation? In preparing this, I learned that not only has simulation been available for two or three decades, it's actually been available quite a bit longer. It was used in the 19, in the 19th century in Europe. There were Aztec birthing simulators made of stone used thousands of years ago. This technology, or the idea of this technology, has been around for quite a while. In the last 19 years since that Institute of Medicine report that I mentioned, there have been a, a huge increase in using and creating simulators and simulation centers. The, the few questions that haven't been answered, however, are how much of a difference does it make? Somebody brought this up. Assessment. We're spending a lot of money and a lot of time on these things. Do they really work? Do they make teams better? Do they make individuals better? Do they improve patient safety? And by now I can tell you that the emerging answer is in many cases we've looked and they absolutely do make a difference. I want to talk next about the varieties of simulators and how they're used. Then I'll end with the, the, the spectrum of simulation used here at Penn. These are often called task trainers or low procedure simulators. You can use them to teach draw blo drawing blood or starting IVs, central venous catheters, arthroscopy or, or, or knee or shoulder injections, Foley catheters, GU catheters. Again, task trainers, relatively cheap, relatively low tech. They're fun. This is a um, um, family day at the Penn Simulation Center, and you can see even kids enjoy these things because of the interactivity, except maybe that kid. <laughs> He's probably going to be a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> there are higher fidelity procedure simulators, and these are in the realm of virtual reality trainers. This one is used for um, um, GI procedures. It has, these are somewhat older pictures, the virtual reality environment is better and better every year, but this is just for, for GI trainers. There are similar simulators for G, GU procedures. We use them for bronchoscopy, um, one of the procedures that I do. And there's been several studies now suggesting that if you do 20 virtual bronchoscopies before you do your first actual bronchoscopy, your, your patients will cough less and bleed less, and your attending physician will yell at you less. And we call those relevant outcomes. Okay. Okay. So, so does this stuff work? It clearly does make the individual more confident and faster. Um, it seems to be a safe and controlled setting. There's no risk for patients with any of these. It's fun, and so the learners want to come back and do it again and again. And it offers the opportunity for repetition and something called deliberative practice, which in adult learning theory means just you can keep doing it until you feel like you know what you're doing. And that's important and not always available when the thing that you're practicing on or learning on is a patient. Again, does simulator practice improve patient outcomes or safety? For example, fewer complications, less anesthesia? And again, the answer is, in many cases, it's been tested, and it does. There are also computer simulations available. You may not know this, but the students can, and, and faculty as well, can now do their entire resuscitative training, that ACL, advanced life support or basic life support, online or on a computer, and then just come for a, a half-hour skills session to our simulation center. I'm not sure that's such a great idea, but it is available now, and there is some evidence that it's an effective way to learn resuscitative techniques. I want to spend the rest of the time uh, I'm talking about types of simulators on high fidelity human patient simulators. Here's one right here. Just to give you an example of what these things are, they can blink and speak and cry, they breathe, they have heart and lung and belly sounds, abdominal, abdominal sounds. This one in particular is wireless and portable, so you can take them to a clinic or to an ER setting if you want. They're programmable, so you can have things happen in sequence without the operator having to do anything. Some of them, like this one here, recognize drugs and doses. If you 
uh, his vial of medication has a little RFID chip in it, his arm has a similar chip, and if you give him dopamine or if you give him epinephrine, he knows what to do. Uh, and, and in fact, he can, he can actually respond to different doses of the drug in different ways. And you can put a human patient simulator like him in a very realistic setting, here in a recovery room or an operating room. You can create an emergency, his blood pressure is low or he's bleeding or something goes wrong, and have the, the team of people or, or the physicians or the nurses separately, whichever way you want to do this, respond. And we do this all the time. I'll tell you a little bit about it. We can enhance Fidelity, that is, make these things more realistic in several ways. The, the, the general term that's used is moulage, and it, it means makeup or props. Or Here is a list, I found this online, of recipes for a variety of fluids and substances that you might use to en enhance fidelity in your simulation. This isn't the one that we use. I should tell you that we at the Penn Simulation Center have a, a, a recipe for emesis, for vomitus, that is, it's made of Coke syrup and food thickener, and it not only looks like vomit, it has the, the, the other uh, nice uh, feature that it's delicious. I mean, you... <laughs> so when you're finished with the, you, you don't want, you don't want to know. Okay, anyway. So how do you use these things? Well, this is at the children's hospital. This is a, a, a high-fidelity infant mannequin, um, a resuscitation with the entire team, a respiratory therapist, a pharmacist, a doctor, several nurses, resuscitating the baby. These are done routinely at the children's hospital. They're actually pioneers in this kind of thing. And it's been shown that they improve communication, performance, and outcomes. Outcomes. They save lives by doing this kind of thing regularly. Another way of using human patient simulators is in team training for high risk but rare events. And this is actually from the, from the Penn Sim Center. We do this once a month. Fire in the OR or smoke in the OR occurs maybe 200 times a year in American hospitals. So it's a, clearly a very important thing. There are flammable gases around. But how do you train people for it? Since it happens so rarely, it's very difficult to train for. But this is how you can train for it. You can make it happen, have the, have the team go through it together and learn what their responsibilities are, and, and train effectively for a rare but important event. I thought I'd throw this in just to show you how much these things cost. Everything, anything from $150 to a suit, for a suture tutor to uh, uh, the, the, the lap mentor is a virtual reality trainer teaching laparoscopic procedures, $172,000. Simman here costs between seventy dollars and $90,000, depending on how you outfit him. We got a discount because we traded in our old ones, so he was only <laughs> $60,000 for us. The Da Vinci robot trainer. You may know the Da Vinci robot device itself, $2 or $3 million. The trainer costs half a million dollars. All right, so what's happened so far with simulation? Surgery, anesthesia, anesthesiology, internal medicine, other specialties now require simulation-based training of residents. Surgery was the pioneer there, and they use it the most. The FDA requires simulation-based training of physicians using new devices. States and hospitals require surgeons who perform laparoscopy to complete simulation-based training. This is actually one of the ways that the Sim Center makes a little money because everything we do costs money, but if we charge outside surgeons a little bit for the, this certification, we can make a little money to use in our other programs. Most medical schools and nursing schools, and I should add here, dental schools, very, very uh, real consumers of simulation technology, and also pharmacy and respiratory therapy, um, most of the schools now either have a simulation center or are sharing a simulation center or attend a regional simulation center. This is the Penn Sim Center. It opened in July 2008 in the OR suite of Gradual, Graduate Hospital at uh, 18th and, uh, 1800 Lombard in Philadelphia. It has the advantage of being an actual hospital. It looks like a hospital, so it didn't require a lot of money to turn it into a usable simulation center. The other way that helps us is because we look like a hospital, we can rent ourselves out 
to uh, National Geographic Channel. M. Night Shamlian has used us a few times. We look like a hospital, so you can film in our facility without, without having to clear out patients, and we make a little money that way. 22,000 square feet. Our ORs, the actual old ORs, have now been modified, so one still looks like an OR, but one looks like an ICU, one looks like an ED bay, one looks like a labor and delivery uh, uh, suite. There are conference rooms, virtual reality labs, a skill lab, task trainers, and a computer lab, of course. Here at the med school, there's a smaller suite over in the Stemmler building, the MISI simulation suite, opened about 10 or 12 years ago. It also has some facilities, like a sim OR and an ICU and a classroom and a control room, and it's currently used by the med students and the residents for heart and lung sound training, a little bit of scenario training. The patients on the medicine clerkships come there. I just did this last Friday, for, and we run through a case of acute coronary syndrome, asthma, sepsis, and they, they learn to take care of some of those things and the problems that can come up. So uh, the last thing I wanted to do is to just talk briefly about simulation in the curriculum at the med school currently and some of the things that we're planning. So one of my other jobs is I, I run the... Uh, the, the, med, the med students' pulmonary course in the second year, and there's a session in my course um, teaching lung sounds, uh, learning to appreciate lung sounds with recorded sounds. That's a type of simulation. See if I can play one for you. Uh, not working. Oh, not working. Okay. So lung sounds is one way we use simulation in the curriculum. Something. Uh, I'm just going to, yeah, I'll just go on to the next one here. All right. Does it work? There we go. So that's a, a vesicular, a normal vesicular sound. Rowls. And my favorite. A wheeze. And, and one of the ways that we teach lung sounds, heart sounds are taught similarly with recorded or digital sounds. The students have training in resuscitation techniques, BLS and ACLS. It's all simulation-based and done at the Sim Center. There are now multiple courses, a pre-clerkship course to prepare them to go on the wards where we teach them some basic procedures. During the clerkship, there's scenario training, the ones I just mentioned for medicine, AC, acute coronary syndrome, asthma, sepsis. Surgery has a full day at the Sim Center teaching surgical uh, uh, procedures. Uh, there's a pre-sub-internship, so before the students do their sub-internships, they actually come to us at the Sim Center, and we'll do some training in scenarios, hypotension, chest pain, uh, those kinds of things. Pre-internship, that is just before they graduate, the, most, of the, most of the departments now have a capstone or pre-internship course. Surgery does one, pediatrics does one, medicine does one. A multiple-day course where we review the three or five or seven things that, that directors of internal medicine or surgery programs tell us the students don't do so well and could we help them to, to, to remember how to do certain things and these might be anything from interpreting a blood gas to, uh, to putting in an NG tube to starting a central line. And so that training is now already built into the curriculum. I thought I'd mention briefly just surgical simulation because the surgeons are the biggest users of simulation in the curriculum, both for the undergraduates and graduate medical education. There is a rotation at the simulation center where the senior surgeons come down, the med students and the, and the residents go down and learn suturing techniques. In, in one exercise, they actually create, I, I call this surgical camp. In the morning, they come in and they create an abdominal aortic aneurysm out of Gore-Tex. Then they have juice and cookies. And then in the afternoon, they come back and we actually put the graft, the, 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 the abdominal aortic aneurysm, in a, a, a relatively realistic looking patient and then they fix it. And this is not a real surgery. This is the surgical attending and a trainee and a scrub nurse in the SIM OR at the SIM Center repairing an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Finally, uh, th this was a, just to show you the, some of the uses of simulation. You may have heard of the Penn-Botswana partnership. Med, med students and residents go to Botswana in South Africa, take care of patients uh, in that setting. 
And the program almost died about seven or eight years ago when a very high percentage of the patients were found to be, to be HIV positive, and an alarming number of the students and residents were getting needle stick injuries. And so we were asked at the Simpson, I'm not going to give you numbers, I've been told not to tell you, but uh, it, it was alarming. Uh, we were asked at the Simpson Center to develop a training program that would do this kind of training Safely, what the problem was that there wasn't safety equipment available. Ultrasound wasn't available. Safety needles and safety catheters weren't available in Botswana. And so we were asked to develop a training program to do this. And this is an example of a student learning to do a thoracentesis before she left for Botswana, where she would then be doing spinal taps and thoracentesis. And using that simulation-based intervention, we were able to decrease the number of needle stick injuries, which had been about 20 to 30 percent, to zero. There hasn't been a needle stick injury in seven years since we started that program. Okay. And finally, the mock code or in situ simulations, and this is what I was talking about earlier. We'll stick sim men in a bed in the ICU or the CCU or the recovery room or sometimes even in a patient room or sometimes even in a, in a lounge and call a code and make them have a heart attack. And the entire team arrives and takes care of them. And we've been able to show this is now done regularly at the Children's Hospital, at the VA, and most recently just started at HUP. And we've been able to show increase in number of rapid response calls, improved survival at codes, and improved knowledge and confidence and skills among the practitioners. So with that, I'm going to conclude with this slide. I don't know why I put it in there. It's funny. I like it. Huh? But I, I do have a demonstration for you. Uh, this is Simen. This is actually Mr. Franklin, Mr. Benjamin Franklin. And he's having a little chest pain. Can I have a couple of you, a, a, any volunteers who would like to meet Mr. Franklin? Somebody come up and somebody join us. Anybody? Uh, come on. I, I saw you get up there. Come on down. I'd like to introduce a few of you to Ben. Yeah, come on down. Sure. So Mr. Franklin, by the way, before we start, uh, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. That's Joe Durrance, our, our simulation technologist. I point him out to tell you to ignore him completely. He's not really there. Okay. So this is Mr. Franklin. You're going to see his vital signs over there on the sides. I'm going to give you a stethoscope. I'm going to give you a stethoscope. One more stethoscope. Would you come around there? I, I'm, I'm short one stethoscope, but we'll get you in there. Listen to his lungs. You should be hearing heart sounds and lung sounds. And whatever you hear, we could make them louder or softer. We could give them a murmur or a click or abnormal breath sounds. Yeah, take a listen. You can all get in there. You can take his blood pressure. You could do a tracheostomy on him. A variety of things you can. Mr. Franklin, how you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm feeling okay now, but I, I was having some chest pain. Chest pain? L yeah. Listen, let me finish with the alumni. These people have money. I, I, I don't... <laughs> I, I'll, I'll get back to you in a minute. So he's All right, my, my heart is, feels like he it's He does starting. have a pulse. So somebody just asked about pulses. He has a pulse in his neck. It's a little hard to feel. He has another one in his wrist. His best pulse, he doesn't like it when I do this, but his best pulse is in his groin. So if you feel right there... You're right there, and you can feel a nice pulse. You feel that? And if you look at his vital signs, by the way, his heart rate's getting a little high there. Yeah, I'm Mr. not Mr. Franklin? Good. Mr. Franklin, are you okay? Yeah, I, yeah I'm not feeling good at all. Uh, anything yeah. in particular? Well, my chest, my heart is racing. Chest and heart are no, racing. It's not feeling good. Should we do something about that? do something. He, he'll be all right. Don't, don't worry about it. Anyway, so a couple of other things he can do. He can have a seizure. We can actually make him have a seizure and then train in the treatment of the seizures. Mr. Uh, Mr. Franklin, can you seize for us? Notice him shaking here. And you can actually change the amplitude. He can shake less or shake more. Um, another thing he can do, notice, he, he, notice that his lips and mouth are blue. This is called cyanosis if, you're not, if you don't have medical training. And, and when his oxygen level drops below, right, notice that the second line, wow, look at that. Look at that. His um, heart rate's up to 111. His oxygen's at 85. That's what, this is called cyanosis, and it happens when the oxygen level turns too low. He's got some extra beats there, too. Probably should do something about that, shouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> nah, he'll be, he'll be okay. All right, Please. anyway, so what were we saying? Oh, I want to try something. Put your finger in his mouth. I want to show you something. 
I want you to trust me on this. Put your finger in his mouth. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> so you, you're going to notice two things. First, he'll clench. This is called tresmus. Tresmus, jaw clenching. Did he? Did he? Yeah. Okay, now I want you to put your finger in his mouth. And you're going to feel his tongue swelling. Did you feel his tongue swelling? So that's called lingual edema, and that's a sign of severe. You can let, let go, Mr. Franklin. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so that's a sign of, of a severe allergy. Holy man, look at his heart rate. Yeah, you got to help me. Like, we probably should do something. Oh, let's just finish up. He'll, he'll be okay for a few minutes. We'll be right with you, Mr. Franklin. Um, where was I? Oh, so anyway, so you can, uh-oh. Anybody know what that is? It's V-fib. What should we do now? Does anybody know, does anybody know CPR? You know CPR? Oh, this is great. Come on over here. Come on over here. So what you're going to, you, you, I want you to do some CPR. While she's doing that, I want you to breathe for him. Okay, wait a minute. Hang on a second. Okay. So come over here and squeeze this bag. Every time she does 30 compressions on his chest, you're going to squeeze the bag once. Okay, now do you know how fast to go? Yes. How fast? To the staying alive. You, so staying alive? You know who the artist is there? No. The Bee Gees. It's the oh, Bee Gees. Okay. So. Well, you're going to be stuck. So here, pick these up. I'm going to turn this to. I'm going to charge it. I want you to yell to your friends here clear. Yell clear. Clear. Okay. Now put one there. One there, and the other one on that. And when you're ready, hit the orange button. Hit that with both fingers. You gotta hit the other orange button right there. Go ahead and push. Push. Did it work? You got him back. You got him back. Wow. Uh, you can put those what down. Thank you. M Mr. Franklin, are you okay? Mr. Franklin? I feel like dancing. How's your, how's your chest pain? Are you doing all right? Feeling a little better. Okay, listen, listen. If you need to speak to an attorney for any reason, my name is Dr. Ellison, Dr. Patricia Ellison. That's the name you want to give the attorney, all right? Okay. All right. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for saving my Thanks. life. So that's all I have. If you have any questions for me, or for Joe, thanks Joe for doing that. This is your chance. And if any of you want, yes. The learning requires repetition in the longer spaces you've been exposed to the technique. Uh, do we have any ways for your students to check back in for a quick video of what they should be doing? We do that all the time. It's a very important question. Can you the question? So the, the question was, is there the ability to come back and practice these things? You know, just doing it once or twice might give you an interesting experience, but have you really learned at that point? And so, for example, the, the, the small procedure trainers, they're available at any time. Students who come for a session can repeat it, can do it repeatedly during the session, but the, the space is available and time can be reserved, or they can just come in on their own and practice a spinal tap or a phlebotomy or IV insertion. The, the, uh, the, the pulmonary fellows will come back every Wednesday afternoon to practice bronchoscopies. The, the, the um, in situ or mock events that we do in the hospital, we do them every month. Now, we don't always catch the same group of residents or students, but there's that ability for the nurses. And, yes? You, know, you mentioned the process of learning, C1, D1, teach one. You have the students teach, use that technique, then you teach other students. It, I, I, we're trying to get away from see one, do one, teach one, but there is some opportunity for the students to use and teach each other, particularly, yes, with sounds. Uh, with some of the trainers, there's almost always a senior faculty, faculty person there, but there's some opportunity for some of the less high-tech um, sound training, for instance, for the students to teach each other, yes. Yeah. Other questions? Yep. Any simulation for psychiatry? That's a really interesting question. I have had the psychiatrists come to us and ask about what's available. I don't know if they're actually doing any. Neurology does. I don't know if psychiatry does. They use standardized patients, and you're going to hear in the next half hour about standardized patients. This is another type of simulation, not exactly high tech. These are actors, and they're used in psychiatry for physical ex for exams and for uh, me medical interviewing. 
But this type, I, I, I'm not sure. I actually don't know the answer to that. Yes? In response to that, I read and heard about a program called GANI, which is artificial intelligence, where a person with a psychiatric issue calls up and the machine gives them a diagnosis and they can change it on a... I've read about that, too. That. I've read about that, too. That's all in the play, too. And AI in general is a is a whole new type of simulation that's been looked at. Um, we're we're certainly not doing it, but I know that it's available as well and very interesting. Yes, I agree. Yes. Is the simulation coordinated with what they're learning in in the classroom? And, I mean, for instance, yes. Yeah, so in my course. They learn during, during the pulmonary course that I direct, there are sessions in the afternoon on lung sounds. Um, some of the simulation is coordinated. So for example, during the clerkships, we don't know what they will have been exposed to on the wards at any particular time. So we pick the sort of bread and butter cases, acute coronary syndrome, sepsis, asthma, and about halfway through the clerkship, they are exposed to these things. So in that sense, I'm not sure if they've seen these things already, but they're things we think they should learn. And by the time they get to halfway through a clerkship, they probably have seen a case of asthma or a case of chest pain. So we're trying to coordinate it, but that, but that can be difficult. As far as the, the kids who go to Botswana, the week before they go, or the two weeks before they go, is exactly when they have that training. So it is coordinated in that way. Yep. When they learn lobotomy, simulation, at what point and what is the earliest they actually draw blood from a real patient? Yeah, so, so the whole idea here is that when I learned, we drew blood on each other. Right. We don't want them doing that. So they'll do five or six or seven of these in the simulation lab, and the first time they'll draw blood on a real patient will be on their clerkships. When they're, when, so, so they'll have the training before clerkships, and, and it won't be until they get into the hospital during clerkships that they'll... I, I, middle of second year. Yep. Do you have simulators in Botswana? Yes, now there are simulators in Botswana. You know, they're not the sixty to $90,000 sim men, but there are simple simulators for IVs and phlebotomy and... Um, that w one, of the, one of the new things in simulation is just-in-time training. So a lot of hospitals who can't afford an entire sim lab and faculty do have just-in-time trainers available in a room, and before you're going to do your spinal tap at 2 o'clock in the morning, go up and practice on the simulator. And that kind of thing is beginning to be available more and more, and it, and it actually is very productive. It's a very good use of time and money. Yes? So we, we didn't have any students who got HIV. I think we identified this soon enough that it wasn't a, an issue, and the program just closed down as soon as we realized it was happening that frequently. I mean, th there are procedures for those students, but it just luckily never happened and wasn't an issue. I can't say that for other schools, but I know that's been our experience. There were no conver HIV conversions. Yes? What about courses for people like myself? My husband has been an aircraft three times to do a doctoral board. I'm not so sure. Um, because you do best what you do most frequently. And I think uh, it's very nice to uh, educate the young people in the beginning. But uh, there are some of us out there that. Um, need refresher courses yeah. to feel confident. And I think that the such a there, there are some community-based courses. Most simulation centers do. We do cardiac, acute uh, adult cardiac life support and basic life support for the community. Anyone can come in and take one of our courses. There are not general courses in procedures, for example, for community-based nurses or physicians. But after the experience, I have one of those certificates. We did it at the uh, local first aid but it's not yeah, yeah. I, I know that the National Board at their meetings and the American Board of Internal Medicine at their meetings are having refresher courses built into their meetings on certain procedures, like central lines, for example. So for physicians who feel they need a refresher course. And ultrasound is another one. With the advent of ultrasound, more and more simulation centers and meetings are having ultrasound courses for physicians who aren't familiar. 
All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Good morning, everybody. My name is Denise Lamara. I'm the director of the Standardized Patient Program here in the School of Medicine. And I'll tell you all about our program in just a minute. But first, I want to turn your attention to a conversation between one of our medical students, Moses. He's, um, he's about to speak to Mrs. Franklin, the wife of that patient who was in Dr. Lipschick's scenario. He needs to um, tell her what happened, so. Good morning, Mrs. Franklin. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm a little tired, but I'm okay, I guess. That's understandable. Has anyone come by to chat with you yet this morning? No, I just got here a, a little bit ago. How is he? He's stable, doing as we expected. I was hoping to take a little time now and update you on your husband's condition. Yeah, please. So as you know, he came in yesterday with chest pain, not feeling well. Um, we eventually identified a dangerous cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, he had a cardiac arrest. We were able to resuscitate him successfully, and he's been with us ever since. Uh, what I want to share with you this morning is that there is a possibility that an error occurred uh, in how we initially handled your husband's condition. You see, when he first came in, we saw some uh, ventricular fibrillation on his electrocardiogram, um, and there was a delay in getting to uh, an appropriate intervention for him. Wait, wait, wait. What, what does that mean? Uh, an error? This is pen. I, I, what, I, please explain this to me in plain English. Yes, I'm sorry. So there was a delay in the time between when we identified the dangerous arrhythmia um, in his heart and when we initially intervened for him. Uh, it's tough to say if our knowledge of that sooner would have prevented his cardiac arrest, but that is a possibility. So you're telling me that his heart attack could have been prevented? Maybe. Uh, the important thing is that he's stable now. Wait, 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 maybe? You don't even know? What the hell happened? Ma'am, you know, your, your husband has a very complex past medical history, um, and like I said, there was this delay. It's difficult to say if Anything we could have done sooner would have changed his course. But again, that is a possibility, and we're glad that he's stable now. Give me a name. Excuse me? A name. I want to know who dropped the ball. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't think that's going to be particularly helpful. All the care we do here is interdisciplinary. There's a, a team of people who uh, take care of all our patients. Oh, so you're telling me there's a whole team of incompetent people now. Is that right? <laughs> Ma'am, as, as the attending physician, I ultimately take responsibility for the care that all our patients receive on, under my care. I, I can totally understand your anger, your frustration. Um, what I want to let you know is that we will be investigating this fully so it doesn't happen again. I'm making sure that we have our best people taking care of your husband. Um, I want to give you my business card, and you should feel free to call me at any time as questions come up. Um, and. I just want to tell you how sorry I am that this happened to you and your husband. Okay. Um, okay, so where does that leave us now? Well, I think we will keep an eye on him for the next couple of days, um, and, and really time will tell. What I can tell you is that his cardiac arrhythmia it has not returned. He's stable, um, and we used an echocardiogram, which was also reassuring. Would you like to go see him now? Yes, let's go. Okay, Moses did a great job de-escalating, didn't they? Let's give him a hand. Thank you. So you guys can, we'll, we'll see them again in a few minutes. Uh, Jesse was portraying Mrs. Franklin. Jesse is one of our standardized patients, or SPs as we call them. So SPs are lay people trained extensively to portray and evaluate medical, they portray, they portray patients and family members and other roles to evaluate and teach medical students and other healthcare professionals. SPs have been used in medical education since the early 60s, and they've been used at Penn since 1997. 
So a couple years ago, uh, we did a survey of all program directors and course directors who use simulation throughout the health system, and communication training with standardized patients was rated uh, higher than all other modalities. Um, so some of the benefits of standardized patients, unlike peer-to-peer -peer role play or hiring actors who are not trained according to standards of best practice, um, SPs provide a standardized, as the name implies, measurable, reproducible experience. Um, this gives faculty control over the content and the complexity of cases. So we work very closely with faculty to make sure that the portrayal and the feedback that standardized patients provide from the patient's perspective all align with the curriculum goals. Uh, the other thing about standardized patients is because we there are many hundreds of articles supporting the use of standardized patients, it's a validated and reliable teaching and testing methodology. It's recognized by LCME, ACGME, and maintenance of certification bodies as an effective way to teach and train. At Penn, medical students start seeing uh, standardized patients in the fall of their first year as part of the humanism curriculum in a patient, a uh, course called Doctor-Patient Relationship. They then work with standardized patients uh, from August through December of their second year during intro to clinical medicine quite extensively over the course of many weeks. They do a lot of practice history taking, physical exam techniques, and then that course culminates in a differential diagnosis course in December just prior to their clinics. Um, when they start the clerkship year, they see standardized patients in a few exams at the end of the family and internal medicine clerkship and at the end of the surgery clerkship. Then when they're done the entire clerkship year, they do a 12-station summative exam that mirrors the USMLE exam, uh, step 2 CS. So that's to prepare them and to assess all of their clinical skills in the core clerkships. So just a little bit of information about the way our program's been growing. I've been here since 2006. Prior to that, I worked at the national boards of osteopathic medical examiners and the regular NBME uh, on both of their standardized patient exams. So I've been doing this for about 18 years. Um, for the past 15 years at Penn, you can see the blue bars indicate medical school programs, so UME. The red bars are UPHS and GME, as well as frontline staff. And then the green bars are external partners. So ACGME, School of Veterinary Medicine, School of Dental Medicine. Um, I'm not sure if the numbers are visible, but we run more than 100 and it's about 115 programs at this point. So it's been... Um, like drinking out of a fire hose, but it's good. Uh, it's a good problem to have. It speaks to the way that the learners and the faculty really embrace this methodology. The themes and applications are really endless. We do anything you can imagine, breaking bad news, disclosing medical errors or adverse events, uh, obtaining informed consent, dealing with a patient who has boundary issues. I mean, you name it and we do it. We offer programs for learners at all stages of their education, from preclinical to practicing physicians. Um, someone asked a question about uh, maintenance of certification. We work with the Pennsylvania Medical Society to help certify uh, and assess physicians who are re-entering practice. Um, so we also work outside of medicine. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, this is a recent picture from Health Equity Week. SPs can be trained for a variety of roles, as I mentioned. So not just standardized patients, but they can be standardized professionals. So these are all SPs uh, from Health Equity Week. Uh, on the left, though, we have a medical assistant. We have a, phys a physician. We have a patient service rep in the middle, and then some patients and family members. So we can really make SPs do anything we want uh, because we hire the best SPs, and they're so versatile and talented. So it makes our job a lot of fun. Um, this 
graph shows how the program has been growing. So aside from the health system and the medical school, this is our growing list of clients with whom we work. And then last year to celebrate and, and um, recognize this exponential growth and to celebrate our 20th year, we worked with leadership to really establish ourselves as a hub for experiential learning and assessment. We're still the standardized patient program, but we felt like it was really critical to acknowledge this growth in some way. Uh, so I like to call this kind of like the last supper picture of SPs, but uh, it's, it really is a nice photo because it, um, I think it illustrates very well the diversity and the camaraderie of our SPs. This is from our Intro to Clinical Medicine course. And um, again, the the way that we have grown, it's been because we collaborate with amazing, creative faculty who are really flexible, and we've had a lot of freedom, which we've enjoyed to be able to try different things. Um, and the SPs, as I said, the majority of our SPs are professional actors. Uh, we train them very extensively, and it's and it's great. You're going to see um, another. Are you guys ready? Okay. <laughs> We're going to see, uh, as I mentioned, sometimes patients portray team members. So now we're going to see uh, Moses in the role of extern. And this case was developed as part of our patient safety curriculum. And it, it was um, speaking up to power is the name of the, the case. But he's going to have a conversation with a um, junior admitting resident Again, Mr. Franklin, he's had a rough couple days. He's now in the medical ICU. He's down the hall. Suspend your disbelief. He's not right here. And uh, Moses is going to have a talk with Dr. Flack. Oh, hey, Christine. Uh, what's up? Uh, Mr. Franklin's central line, I think it's infected and needs to be removed. I know it's been super busy, but I've been trying to nail it down. It should be just a couple of moments. Uh, I'm too busy for this right now. I saw Franklin before round started. I, I wasn't impressed. He seemed fine, and he's ready to go back on the floor tomorrow. How do you even know if it's infected? Uh, well, he spiked a temp this morning. His white count's a bit up. Um, you know, the nurse pointed out at erythema at the site. I, I think it should come out. He's had a rough couple of days, pneumonia. He has this risk for septic shock. I'm worried about him. Look, um, there's a reason why she's a nurse and not a doctor. Uh, do you know what MD stands for? Uh, medical doctor? Makes decisions. Um, the site is just irritated. Probably it's an allergic reaction to the catheter. You don't even know that it's infected. And right now, there are more urgent matters. Uh, patients who have real changes in vitals, dropping pressure. Uh, we have to talk to parents of a son who's in a coma. We have to write up notes for tomorrow. Plus, we have an admission coming from South Jersey in about an hour. So I, I don't have time. Uh, yeah, I, I get that. But isn't it MICU policy that if there's redness at the site, it's infected? I, I just, I'm worried about him. I don't want him to get sicker. Look, kid. Don't be such an alarmist. His white blood count is only mildly elevated. What, we, what your patient's family is really interested in is getting him out of the ICU. His vitals are stable, it's just redness. There's no pus. If there's no pus, there's no infection. Uh, I could ask the SAR if you're too busy. No, she doesn't need to be bothered with something so trivial. Uh, we have patients crashing. If you're so worried about him, why don't you remove the central line? You've observed CVC removals here, yes? I've seen a few. Great, then you can do this. This is a teaching hospital. See one, do one, teach one. That's how I learned. Uh, I don't think I can do that. It's a uh, policy, medical students can't take out lines. It's, it's a dangerous procedure. You are such a stickler for the rules. I thought you wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> <sighs> I, can, I can get everything, set it up for you, make it really easy, it'll only take a moment. All right, um, I'll, I'll go over it and look at it myself as soon as I'm done with this one patient. But you're gonna have to go get me a cup of coffee. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay, I don't know how, I think we're a little behind on time, so I don't know if we have time for questions, if anyone has questions. 
Someone asked about psychiatry. Um, we did do a study with one of the departments in psychiatry where uh, the per study participants, um, their levels of stress were measured. So we did some physiological testing while the SPs did things to create stressful conditions. So that was an interesting way that we used high tech simulation, but we do a lot of psych psychiatry programs, just conversational programs and evaluation. And somebody had a question here. Class of 1968, I practice in Africa. Simulators are very expensive and I have a bunch of questions. This involves people and people we have. One, who trains standardized patients? Two, what is the cost of training them? Three, after training them, what was the last the question? Okay. Okay, that's a lot of questions, which I'm going to give you my card so I can go into detail offline. But uh, the questions were essentially about how do we recruit them? How do we pay standardized patients? How do we train them? So we train our standardized patients. There is a, a wealth of literature, and it's an evidence-based methodology. So there are standards of best practice around training standardized patients and recruiting them. So we do rigorous screening process for training um, we do a little bit of a flipped classroom approach we send them the case materials to study they'll watch videos they come in we do extensive role play there's a lot of QA quality assurance involved um, we have a lot of metrics to make sure that they're doing everything in a standardized way so the, the whole point of um, when we talk about standardized patients we can make sure that all 165 students, is that how many we're getting this year? Uh, we can make sure that they all see the same John Smith with the same conditions. Uh, we're very, very strict about uh, creating conditions for learning and assessment that are very realistic. So the SPs have to portray the case in a realistic manner, but also within certain parameters so that it is standardized and the, the level of pain that they're simulating is all very precise. And we, I'll give you my card and I could talk obviously for hours about this, but we'll talk. Any other questions? Yes. Can you do a, a video of their sessions to give them feedback with the supervision? Some of our programs do involve videotaping. Um, it depends where we run the programs. When we run them down at 1800 Lombard, we do videotape, and they have an opportunity to watch the video with a faculty coach. We give them access to their videos as well as uh, comments from the, from the standardized patients. Uh, Faculty, we have a system where faculty can watch the student's video and score the SOAP notes and make notes, comment. They can bookmark certain parts of the video and have the student rewatch it and, um, and read the comments from the faculty. Mm -hmm. This is from a non-MD. Okay, non-MD. I, I, do, I do live with one. <laughs> um, I think what you do is fantastic, and I just wonder, and I suspect I know, there is nothing like this where uh, actors who are trained to portray symptoms go into the general medical community, practicing physicians, and seeing whether there's also standardized diagnosing. Let's say the difference in diagnosing from one physician to another with the same symptoms. They don't have anything like that, do they? So say this again, have the... Whether these actors right. go into the general medical community, practicing physicians, and seeing if with the same symptoms, going to one physician versus another produces the same diagnosis. Well, I'll tell you, yeah, so we can tell you from um, a group of 12 medical students what we see. There's a lot of variation. So we don't currently have the resources to, to uh, do that, but that's an interesting application for sure. And, and actually, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Somebody else had their hand raised? Yeah, earlier you mentioned that you're moving in the direction of a competency-based curriculum. It looks like this is an ideal interface. If you started trying to assess and define the competencies for each of your simulations? 
We are working on that. Uh, we do have rubrics identified. Uh, all of the faculty identify key competencies for every case for the summative exams that students should be hitting. Um, so the SPs have checklists where we just record the events of the encounter and there's a global assessment and then of course the write-up that's all kind of competency based but I think you're talking more about identifying those students and doing some more targeted remediation we do that in a limited way currently but I think we're going to be moving more in that direction and I'm sorry go ahead Let's finish up that's all have you ever had any experience with medical students being standardized patients to learn how to simulate the, the uh, uh, patients. Yes, so there is some literature to suggest that that can be helpful for students in terms of um, increasing their ability to empathize with patients if they role play and portray a patient. Um, for a standardized experience and, and to create a measurable one, we use standardized patients. But yes, for sure, uh, students sometimes will role play. And the other thing that I should have mentioned is that we use standardized patients now beyond healthcare as well. Um, we have used SPs as at-risk clients for a homelessness reduction project uh, with a, an organization in Massachusetts to assess motivational interviewing skills of caseworkers. And we were recently awarded a national grant to work with the Graduate School of Education to train principals how to develop their leadership and professionalism and professional judgment when dealing with racially charged situations and having conversations with parents, uh, teachers, and students. So that's a really exciting project. Uh, again, applications are really limitless. And I know we're pressed for time, so we'll wrap up. I'll be sure to give you my business card if anybody has additional questions. You have one more? Yeah, I just have one question. Um, the question is this. You have the simulation. You have the young person who's starting out. Then you have someone who's more seasoned and experienced and say, let's say it's a terminal ill patient coming in, and you got resources, time involved, and you want to cut that. No, the young sure. person, the young surgeon says, let's go and offer this, do this, and this. The senior surgeon say, look, let's soft help this. You incorporate that because I think with seniority, there comes a wisdom of experience where you will not be as proactive, but still be active but not as proactive versus the young buck who comes and says, we can do all of these wonderful things, and here's the best <coughs> times, and if you listen to the senior more experienced person says, hey, you're not giving up hope, not destroying hope, but you give them or that type of scenario where you say, hey, look, let's, uh, you know in your gut feel that this is not going to turn out positive. Well, so I, I think you're talking about the expertise of someone who's very senior versus someone who's coming in excited and green. Uh, we use our... Yeah. Well, I'm going to recruit you. I'll, I'll give your name to be a faculty preceptor in one of our small groups because that's what we do. We have the faculty really are the, the glue that pulls everything together. The SPs do a great job. The students are willing participants. But then it's the faculty who help them apply what they're learning. And they can kind of tie it together and relay their own personal experience to try to, to close that teaching loop. And I know Susie's looking at me, so do you want me to just wrap up? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> One more question, and then that's... Well, this is, it may not be... This may be for you, <laughs> but given your exponential growth in this, the success of this program, how are you reallocating your budget so that you can try to accomplish all these wonderful experiential programs and moving away from the... You know, traditional lecture type style that we we love. Right? That is a question for no. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no. So we have gotten very creative. So the green bars that I showed you actually mean that we have uh, established ourselves as a revenue generating center within the School of Medicine, which is great. Um, and we just get very creative. I only have three full time staff member inclu members, including myself, uh, one part time trainer, and then we get creative with SPs. Some of them are like super SPs, so we pay 
them a little bit more per hour to train other SPs. Um, and we're we're managing, but it's you know chewing gum and duct tape at this point. But but we get it done. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. All right, those are two very difficult presentations to follow, but we're going to give it a shot. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Ben Johnson. I'm a first year med student, and along with Eden, Mark, and Rob, we're members of the ID interest group here at Penn. We're also joined by Nicholas Moore, who's a second year med student. And we're going to talk to you about how our learning teams work here at Penn. And in particular, we are going to talk about an innovative small group model um, known as the choose your own adventure format. Um, and this learning approach, as well as the presentation that we're going to give today, was developed by Dr. Bob Domes, who's the chief of pathology at CHOP, as well as the course director for our microbiology and infectious diseases course. And as all, you, all, as all of you know, over the past decade, medical education has changed tremendously. And there's been much more of a shift um, away um, from passive learning and more of an emphasis on active learning. Um, and a key part of this approach here at Penn is the use of learning teams. And during the first week of med school, all of us are matched up in a group of seven students. Um, and this is known as our learning team. We stay with this group throughout med school. And we do everything from problem sets to standardized patient exercises together. Um, and just as we'll be assigned to teams during our clerkship years and during our residency programs, um, we are placed in our learning teams, and we're not given a choice of who our classmates are, um, which is a good thing because it means that no matter how we get along at the beginning, we have to figure out a way to make it work as a team. And this is really um, a great step forward in our medical careers as we learn how to collaborate with others. Um, and depending on which course we're taking, we'll have a lecture to small group ratio of anywhere from one to one to two to one. So we see our teammates quite a bit, which for the most part is a good thing because we almost all get along very well. Um, but from the perspective of our course directors, the question is, how do you take what we're learning in lectures and apply it in a relevant way that keeps seven Penn Med students engaged, challenged, um, and paying attention throughout a two-hour small group session? So for years, our small group formats looked something like this. And they still look like this at most med schools in the US. Um, you're presented with a clinical case, maybe some vignettes and a picture. Um, and then you and your learning team need to address a series of questions. And you usually work through them sequentially. This format always worked fine in the past. But when Dr. Dome started updating our small groups four years ago, he wanted to develop a format that would more closely approximate the process that students will need to employ in the clinics. And the problem with the classic format is that it's very linear. Questions are asked, asked students respond, more information is presented, and then more questions are asked, and you just keep on lather, rinse, repeat. Um, students really don't need to make any decisions, and there's no way to make the prompts dynamic in response to the answers that the students provide. Um, so in the clinics, we'll obviously need to respond to open-ended questions, but more importantly, we'll also need to make decisions, uh, often with incomplete data. Uh, and this reality wasn't reflected in the traditional med school problem set. Um, and it's also important to note that when our micro ID course concludes at the end of December of our first year here at Penn, um, we're only 12 months away from our first clinical rotation, um, which will require us to not just respond to prompts, but to think critically and to make decisions. Um, they're supervised decisions, but they're decisions nonetheless. Um, so the question was, how do you change the small group format so that it more closely simulates clinic? Um, and as with so many other things in life, 
the answer was found in children's books. Um, so you may remember the Choose Your Own Adventure series of kids' books um, from when you were kids or raising kids. Um, and each story was written from a second-person point of view with the reader assuming the role of the protagonist. And at the end of each short chapter, there would be a question and you would have to make a decision. And depending on the decision that you made, you would turn to a different page um, and you know, you'd read about what happened next and then keep moving through the story. And ultimately, the reader's decisions would determine the plot outcome. Um, so you know, if you were a knight trying to rescue someone from a castle, depending on what decision you made, you could either get eaten by a dragon or you could end the story a hero. Um, so hence, choose your own adventure. And this is essentially what Penn has done with the new small group format. So we still start each problem set with a clinical history. Um, but instead of questions, you now have options. Some are good options, some are bad options, and some lead to even more options. Um, so for example, you may order a chest film, uh, but then you have to interpret the chest film, and then once you've done that, come up with a treatment approach. And as relevant topics arise, you can also link to content from other courses like immunology, anatomy, and ultrasound. So the starting point for a small group cases now looks something like this. Instead of answering questions right away, you make decisions, such as, what do I do first? Which seems like a very simple question, um, but for students who are only three months into med school, um, this is a very helpful exercise to go through. And as you see from the bottom of the page, you can select any option that you like once you've been given the initial clinical presentation. Um, and you can click through the action bu buttons, and each of these buttons are active and hyperlinked to other parts of the slide deck so that you can move around um, forward, backwards, you can skip ahead depending on how quickly the learning team figures out what's going on with the patient. Ultimately, all the different paths lead to clinical decision points, which then guide us through the relevant diagnostic information, um, the differential diagnosis, and then ultimately the treatment plan. So in addition to the choose your own adventure format, um, these problem sets also have a number of other different question sets, including image panels that ask patients to interpret a chest film um, or to name a certain lesion or parasite. So here we have an example of an image panel that we might see when we're learning about parasites. Um, these panels are good open-ended review for students, and they also provide instant feedback. So does anyone want to guess or remember what the first image is? Any pathologists or ID folks in the audience? Well, we're going to help remind you all in a few slides, but um, if you wanted to, we can work through every single one of these and get instant feedback as we identify it with our learning team. Um, so now to give you a sense of how this format really works in practice, we're going to give a live action demonstration of the Choose Your Own Adventure format. Um, and so we invite you to join along with us as we work through the slides. All right, hi, I'm Eden Engel Rebitzer. I'm also a first year and a member of the Infectious Disease Interest Group along with Ben. Um, and what we're gonna do here is we're gonna give you a very rough approximation of what this looks like in real time. Um, so hopefully with some of your participation and some of our participation, we'll walk through um, what this looks like working through one of these problem sets in a group format. So this is our first case. Uh, we have a 26-month-old infant who's up to date on all vaccinations and was well until two days prior to admission when clear rhinorrhea developed without fevers or other symptoms. On the morning of admission, the patient's mother noted increasing irritability and work of breathing, mild drowsiness, and a hoarse cry without fever, drooling, or inability to drink. In the afternoon, the child was transferred to CHOP. The mother shows you a video from her cell phone. So this. Uh, introduces one of the really neat elements of this format for uh, working through problem sets, which is the ease with which kind of multimedia features can be incorporated. Um, so what we have here is our first multimedia feature.
Okay, so aside from that kid being absolutely adorable, uh, we are uh, asked then this kind of open-ended question, which Ben discussed the importance of, about how we would describe what's going on um, in this video. Uh, so do any of you guys have uh, any descriptors you would use? Feel free to raise your hand or shout out. Yes? Inspiratory Strider. Sorry? Inspiratory Strider. We've got a vote for Strider. You got a thumbs up from the back. Anyone else have anything they'd want to add? Contraction of the struggle pulses and uh, retraction, as retraction as he was breathing. Great. So what this would look like in a learning team setup is we'd throw out a ton of ideas and some would be on base like those two and some would be less so and we'd kind of discuss them as a group and see what came out as our top contenders. Um, okay. Anything us students want to add to those descriptors? We think the MDs have it covered. Great. <laughs> All right. So at this point, we move on to a slide after that, what would have been like a five-minute discussion with our learning team. We move on to a slide that gives us a little information to kind of check our hypotheses that we generated. So well done, doctors. This is an example of Strider. Um, and it's a high-pitched breathing sound resulting from turbulent airflow in or around the larynx. And it's caused by a narrowed or obstructed airway. So then we go on to our first clinical uh, decision point here. And they give us some leads. They mention uh, in, our, in our slide, they mention some things that may cause Strider. They mention epiglottis, croup, laryngeal tumor, a foreign body. And then they kind of leave it to us to make a real life or almost real life uh, clinical decision that we would then discuss with our group. And I'm going to hand it over to the next member of the IDIG to talk about how we might work through that clinical decision point as a team. Hi, everyone. My name is Mark. I'm also a first year and also a member of the Infectious Disease Interest Group. Um, so now, sort of as we get to uh, our first clinical decision, uh, decision point, uh, our learning team would sort of discuss you know, the different options and what we think is sort of the most important, what we want to do first. So, yeah, do you have a question? Sorry. First year medical students. Yes. First three months. Yes. Why would they have learned words like stride or something? So in our, in our courses, our, our course directors are great and our lecturers are great. And at, yeah. Uh, and also, so when we are doing these sort of, these, uh, le these learning team exercises, there are always uh, attending physicians uh, circulating in the rooms, uh, helping us with words, with words we're having trouble with, or just helping us make decisions. And I'll, I'll add that one of the neat elements of this format is I do think it exposes us to more clinical language than we get from lecture. So we may learn the causes of Strider in lecture, and then we may hear it and learn the word in these small groups. So I do think the, the, there's some learning of clinical language that happens Thank you. There's some learning. Eh. There's some learning of clinical language that happens within the small group itself. Is this a, so you asked the. So uh, you've had a lecture before you get to this. Hey. You've yes. Had lecture you get to this. Okay. What lectures? So we would have had our infectious disease lecture on kind of the causes of things that may uh, lead to Strider prior to this, and we would have prepared, and that's kind of the feature of the flipped classroom. So we'd come in prepared. For, to apply this learning in a clinical setting. But the word strider may be a, a word that we learn more in the small group format than in lecture. Was there another question back there? Okay, we'll, we'll try to make sure that we use the mics. Um, okay, so at this point, we would be talking as a learning team and trying to come up with sort of the best first thing we can do. So we'll sort of turn that over to you. Uh, we can perform a physical exam, uh, order a CBC with diff, uh, a chest film, or a neck film. Uh, so if you, got, if you think that you would want to uh, do a physical exam first, can you raise your hand? Most people. Anyone want to order a CBC with diff first? Chest film, neck film. Okay, well, a couple. Neck film is second. Okay, so let's, let's first do our physical exam, and we can click that option. Okay, so the child uh, demonstrated severe inspiratory strider uh, with labored breathing, head bobbing, superclavicular retractions, increased work of breathing, and possible tiring. Um, the cry was hoarse, 
uh, temperature was elevated, and pharynx was not exudative, no foreign body was seen. So we've now gotten a little bit more information about our patient, uh, but this also is sort of an opportunity to review other, uh, other types of cases. So we'll also sometimes have uh, other questions that are somewhat related or somewhat not related. Uh, so this is an example. So if instead of this physical exam, we saw this, this in, in the child's mouth, uh, what we would be asked sort of review questions. What would be the leading cause of uh, leading bacterial cause? What would you treat with? And why would you treat? Anyone want to shout out the answer? Strep. Strep? Yeah. 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 Group A strep, uh, strep pharyngitis. Uh, so this is just sort of an example of the ways in which uh, the preceptors and course directors build in uh, review material throughout uh, these, these cases. Um, but now that so we have that physical exam, the inspiratory strider, we can go back to clinical decision point one uh, and explore our other options. Um, so let's, now that we've done our physical exam, who would like to order a CBC with diff? Uh, order a chest film? How about a neck film? Okay, seems like people are sort of involved in a neck film. Does someone want to explain why, why they're interested in a neck film? If I could ask you. Okay, so we're trying to make sure it's not epiglottitis. So that's exactly something that you know we might discuss as a learning team. So it might say, you know, I'm concerned for epiglottitis. I'm concerned for a foreign body or, or something, and I think we should order a neck film. And we discuss, and we've come to sort of a a group decision that we would order a neck film first. Let's say. Okay, a lateral neck film is taken, and the white arrows in the right image are pointing to the problem, uh, and we'd be asked sort of what is this structure, uh, what is this disease called, um, and so does someone want to shout it out? Epiglottitis. Epiglottitis, yeah. So we could click that answer, and that's the correct choice in this case. Um, but it, let's say if we got it wrong, um, let's say we thought it was whooping cough, uh, it would also sort of link us to uh, information about whooping cough and, and what what that looks like and why that was not the answer. Um, so I think this is a good example of the way in which really ha the decisions we make uh, lead to uh, various information that, that's helpful for us in, in learning. Question at the back. Yeah. So if you go through this perfectly, you'll hurt as much. <laughs> uh, yeah. So generally as a learning team, we'll, we'll tend to, when we have more time, we'll, we'll go back and look at all of the options generally, um, just to make sure we sort of review all the, all the material. But yeah, in theory, if you do it all perfect the first time and you don't go back, you learn less. But the way sort of we go through it is we sort of make sure to hit all the points. And, and fortunately or unfortunately, that's not usually a problem. And part of the benefit of this format is that we have all the information you know, all the correct and incorrect answers, you know, in the PowerPoint slides. Um, we don't have to wait for, you know, the attending physician or the senior medical student to come around and give us the information. So we're able to work through it at our own pace and able to access all the information um, that we might find relevant or maybe irrelevant in this case. Um, and it really helps enhance our learning. Uh, you know, as part of being a modern adult learner is, you know, going at your own pace and taking advantage of as many resources as you can. And I think this is a really good format for that. Great. So, so oh, yeah, in the back. Uh, so to, our, to my knowledge, I, I don't know of any other medical schools that use this type of format. Um, and I don't believe this is available to other medical schools, but I could... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are a couple of the medical schools who use a modification of that. Sure. We have a medical school in Southern, Southern California, which we just began, uh, where the students are in small groups. They're given the clinical presentation, like as, stri as far as Strider is concerned. Then what they, they're given is an algorithm or a clinical reasoning guide, and then they put together materials from their basic sciences uh, in terms of the learning process. Sure. So there are definitely sort of variations of, of 
sort of this learning, the problem, problem based learning at other medical schools. But I think this exact, this sort of particular way of going through these problems is, I think, relatively unique to Penn. Sure. Okay, so now that we've sort of come to a diagnosis, epiglottitis, uh, we can move on to sort of another decision, a clinical decision point. And I'll turn it over to, to Rob to talk about that. Okay. Um, we have to get them to the parade. Yes. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Rob. Uh, so I'll just wrap up here. Uh, so we know that we have a child with epiglottitis. Um, cultures have been sent, but results are not yet back. Should this child be given antibiotics? Yes. And which antibiotics would you give this child? Amoxicillin. Okay. Any other antibiotics? Clindamycin is allergic. Clindamycin. Okay. All right. Uh, so we have two choices, amoxicill amoxicillin and clindamycin. So it turns out that um, we are instructed to give ceftriaxone and vancomycin. Um, antibiotic regimens are complicated. There are many different antibiotics um, out there. And um, when working in the learning team, it's helpful to review mechanisms of actions and the correct protocol. So here we are instructed to give ceftriaxone to cover um, gram-negative bacteria and vancomycin for gram-positive bacteria. Um, so uh, cultures were sent, uh, a swab of the throat was taken, and that came back inconclusive. And then blood cultures were also sent, and the results indicate that the child was infected with Haemophilus influenza, type B. Um, and now uh, we're finishing with the case summary, so we know that it was H flu. Um, now that we know what it is, we can also narrow the antibiotic down um, to the to a more uh, definitive antibiotic. And um, uh, it turns out the child actually was vaccinated with um, uh, the H flu vaccine. However, he still developed the infection. So further work is needed to be done to conclude why the child still got the infection. Right. Are there any other questions before I wrap up? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we have individual exams, just like any other med school, but Penn also does team, team exams. So we do have separate exams where we work together as a team and we have to complete that exam. Usually the team exams are harder, but when you have seven heads together, we tend to do really well. Yes. Oh. Yeah, we also do individual exams. So a test day consists of a team exam and then an individual exam. So it makes the exam taking longer, but we learn a lot. Yeah. I think in, in some cases it is actual videos. Um, in some cases, I think it's actually actual videos to my knowledge. Um, any other questions? All right, thank you.